Thank you for joining me um, over your lunch break this afternoon to review the 2019 Worldwide Asthma Guidelines. Uh, I'm Dr. Sue Bullmeyer, a professor of pharmacy practice here at the college. There are no relevant financial interests for myself or my spouse to disclose from the past 12 months. Um, I do want to point out on the right side of your toolbar, there's a chat box, so feel free to uh, pop a question in there. I'll most likely answer those at the end. At the completion of this activity, we're really hoping um, the learning objectives for today are to um, review the updated 2019 GINA asthma guidelines, to identify which patients are candidates for PRN, or as-needed ICS lobotherapy, and to briefly review available and emerging targeted therapies for severe asthma. So let's start with some questions to get you thinking. Which of the following patients is the best candidate for as-needed ICS lobotherapy? A patient with A, infrequent asthma symptoms, B, asthma symptoms more than twice a week, C, troublesome um, asthma symptoms on most days, or D, initially presents with an acute exacerbation. The next question is, which of the following may be self-administered? Omalizumab, Reslizumab, Benralizumab, or Mepolizumab? So as you're probably aware, the U.S. guidelines for treating patients with asthma are pretty outdated. They haven't been updated since 2007. Because of this, the newer biologic agents and drugs with new asthma indications like teotropium are not included. The first biologic, Zolaire or omalizumab, is included, but really not a lot of direction is given other than recommending it for patients that are on step five or six therapy with concomitant allergies. The Worldwide Global Initiative for Asthma, or GINA guidelines, however, are updated yearly. GINA actually states that they are not guidelines per se, but rather an integrated evidence-based strategy focusing on translation into clinical practice. But I think most of us refer to them as guidelines. The GINA Steering Committee actually reviews literature twice a year in an effort to include timely and updated evidence related to treating patients with asthma. Clinicians look to these guidelines to help guide therapy, especially when it comes to those newer agents and treating patients with difficult to control or severe asthma. I have heard that EPR um, has convened a working group and that they are charged with updating the national asthma guidelines. My thinking is that when those are published and we do finally see them, they will probably mirror what we're seeing in modern GINA updates. So let's start with some basic refreshers. We all know that asthma is a common chronic respiratory disease that affects a lot of patients worldwide. Common symptoms are episodic and usually include wheezing, coughing, a tight chest, shortness of breath, and a decrease in expiratory flow. These symptoms are, like I said, episodic or nocturnal, worse at night. Common triggers include exercise, allergens like dust mites, cockroach droppings, pollen, cat and dog dander, or irritants like strong perfumes and chemical odors, and tobacco smoke. Other triggers include barometric changes and viral upper respiratory tract infections like the flu. Next, let's review how a patient with asthma is diagnosed and then treated so we can distinguish between our old national guidelines and our up-to-date ones. We're going to focus on treating patients that are adults. So this should look familiar. We stage patients based on their symptoms, how often they wake up at night with symptoms, how often they use their quick relief inhaler, if they have one, and how limiting their activity level is, as well as their lung function. Patients can be categorized as intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, or severe persistent, and based on those broad categorizations, that's how we determine how to treat them with our stepwise approach. Um, although these staging criteria are from our old national EPR3 guidelines, we review them because they are still widely used by providers, and this, term, this terminology is very commonplace to see in charts, as these staging criteria also have ICD-10 codes associated with them. So this should also look familiar. This is our old EPR3 guidelines. Shouldn't be too many surprises here, probably seen this multiple times. Like I stated before, most clinicians have moved away from using this because their usefulness is kind of limited clinically. Our more recent guideline treatment scheme is this. This is taken from the updated GINA 2019 guidelines. You'll notice step one is drastically different from our usual, just giving everybody as needed albuterol, right? For safety, GINA is no longer recommending SABA-only treatment for step one. And this decision was based on evidence that SABA-only treatment increases the risk of severe exacerbations and that adding any ICS significantly reduced that risk. GINA now recommends that all adults and adolescents with asthma should receive either symptom-driven 
or regular low-dose ICS-containing controller treatment to reduce the risk of serious exacerbations. And this is a population-level risk reduction strategy, similar to what we see with statins and antihypertensives. The other thing I want to point out on this slide is the preferred reliever. Now, remember, these are worldwide guidelines, and other countries have medications that are approved for things that we do not hear. So see these, the preferred reliever is now Simbicort, low-dose ICS and Formoterol, and this is off-label in the United States. Also remember for a while, ICS lava agents had a box warning related to an increased risk of asthma-related death. That has been removed for combination products based on the results of recent studies published by the four manufacturers of those products. The box warning does remain for lava-only agents as they're still not to be used as monotherapy in patients with asthma. Step two is also slightly modified. For patients with mild persistent asthma, you could still recommend low-dose ICS, but per GINA now, you could instead recommend PRN, low-dose ICS, and Formoterol. I want to summarize briefly some of the evidence surrounding regular low-dose ICS with as-needed SABA. None of this really should come as a surprise to us because we know there's a really large body of evidence from randomized clinical trials and observational studies that show us that low-dose ICS substantially reduces risk of severe exacerbations, hospitalizations, and asthma-related death. Serious exacerbations are actually cut in half, um, even in patients with symptoms really infrequently only one to two days a week. And this regimen has been shown to improve symptom control and reduce exercise-induced bronchoconstriction as well. Gina authors noted that poor adherence is common in mild asthma in the community, and they postulate that this regimen really may increase the patient's exposure um, to the risks of SABA-only therapy. You'll also note that low-dose ICS formoterol is also a consideration for step two care. And I want to summarize briefly some of the evidence surrounding this as-needed low-dose ICS formoterol. Again, remember this is off-label in the United States. All evidence I discuss is going to be with budesonide formoterol or brand name Simbacort in the U.S. So we have direct evidence from two large studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing non-inferiority for severe exacerbations with this regimen versus daily low-dose ICS plus an as-needed SABA or albuterol. We also have direct evidence from one large study of 64% reduction in severe exacerbations versus SABA-only treatment, also published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. Patients had reduced symptoms, and one study showed that reduced exercise-induced bronchoconstriction was seen as well. When deciding to include the PRN ICS for Motorol in the GINA guidelines, the authors put a lot of importance on preventing severe exacerbations, avoiding the need for daily ICS in patients with mild or infrequent symptoms, and the safety of as-needed ICS for Motorol in maintenance and reliever therapy. They noted really that they saw they had no safety concerns with the PRN um, dosing strategy. The authors also note that this regimen really mimics what we're seeing in clinical practice and normal patient behavior, really. Patients will seek symptom relief when they need it. So why not give them a way to deliver a controller as well when they're going to go for something that's going to make them feel better? Step three care really hasn't drastically changed. Still a step up from low-dose ICS is to add a LABA agent. Step four is medium-dose ICS plus LABA. You'll also note here that adding teotropium comes into play in step four. So you have a patient on medium-dose ICS plus LABA that is still symptomatic, having nighttime awakenings, and not well-controlled, you could add teotropium. The only LAMA FDA approved for asthma therapy in the United States is teotropium and in the Respimat device. The asthma dose in that Respimat device is 1.25 micrograms, two puffs once a day. Remember, the COPD dose is the 2.5 micrograms, two puffs once a day. I usually recommend giving this at least a two- to three-month trial before you would deem it a failure, so ensuring patients know adherence is important and to stick with the teotropium beyond a few days. And then step five therapy is a little bit more complicated. This is the final step and is really reserved for our most severe patients. I want to bring your attention to some definitions and statistics, and then we'll come back to step five. It's important to point out what some of these terms mean. So uncontrolled asthma is used to describe patients with frequent symptoms and exacerbations. Those with difficult to treat asthma, so these are our patients that are on high-dose controllers, but their asthma remains uncontrolled. 
Things that contribute to this could be the wrong diagnosis, poor device technique, poor adherence, and other comorbid conditions that worsen their asthma like allergic rhinitis, chronic sinusitis, or even uncontrolled uh, reflux. And then severe asthma. So these are going to be your patients that remain uncontrolled despite maximal therapy with good technique and good adherence. Severe asthma is also those patients whose asthma worsens when you try to take a high-dose treatment away or attempt step-down. There is an increasing desire to subdefine asthma based on clinical, pathophysiologic mechanisms and cytokines or biomarkers. Common ways we subdefine asthma is to use phenotypes or endotypes. A phenotype refers to the observable characteristics of a specific disease entity and are clinically relevant because they relate to a patient's presentation, triggers, and treatment response. An endotype refers to the mechanism of the underlying disease and aims to separate by pathophysiologic mechanisms. Endotyping depends on the use of biomarkers that relate to the underlying disease mechanism. And understanding these uh, uh, help us to better understand and use biomarkers from body fluids and or affected tissues. Identification of asthma phenotypes has generally been through clinical characteristics of subjects. The most studied clinical phenotypes are related to age, age of onset of asthma, and duration of asthma. All the available biomarkers available in the clinical practice setting are focused on allergic inflammation. Examples are on this slide and include blood eosinophil counts, exhaled nitric oxide, and sputum eosinophils. So what proportion of adults have difficult to treat or severe asthma? It's actually not too many, approximately only a quarter. So 24% of patients are on step four or five therapy, and then 17% of those have poor symptom control despite that step four or five treatment. And actually, less than 4% have severe asthma. And remember, those are your patients with symptoms despite good adherence and device technique that are on step four or five therapy. So at least it's um, pretty uncommon. So once again, let's look at step five. You'll notice that once here a patient is on high-dose ICS plus lava, the next step is to refer for phenotyping, and then we can add on therapy if needed. You could add teotropium here as well as step four, but really what, what I really want to discuss is the add-on of biologic agents like anti-interleukin-4 uh, um, anti and interleukin-5, as well as anti-IgE. It's also really important that once you get to this stage of therapy, you ensure proper step therapy has been initiated. If a patient requires step five, we would wanna ensure the diagnosis of asthma is correct. We've looked for contributing factors like we talked about, poor device technique, poor adherence. We wanna ensure any comorbid disease states are being controlled. We also wanna look at any modifiable risk factors that we could address um, in the home or the workplace like patient smoking, secondhand smoke exposure, any environmental allergens, also if they're on an NSAID or a beta blocker. Next, management should be optimized. So ICS lava therapy and the addition of um, the add-on with teotropium should be considered. Non-farm therapy like weight loss and also ensuring vaccines are up to date with the yearly flu shot and pneumonia are also important. Psychosocial problems like anxiety and depression should also be addressed as they are, these are really common in patients with severe asthma and are actually associated with a higher rate of exacerbations and um, emergency department visits. If patients have severe asthma, we want to assess their asthma phenotype and factors that are contributing to their symptoms, quality of life, and exacerbations so we can better tailor their therapy. So let's break down step five um, in GINA 2019. As previously discussed, adding teotropium is an option. It has been shown to modestly improve lung function and the time to severe exacerbations. Omalizumab is the oldest of the biologics, and it has been approved since 2003 in kids greater than 12. However, recently got approved for kids um, greater than or equal to 6. It binds to IgE on the surface of mast cells and basophils. Therefore, it decreases the release of inflammatory mediators in the allergic response. Zolaire is indicated for moderate to severe persistent asthma in patients six years of age and older who have a positive skin test or an in vitro reactivity to a perennial aeroallergen and whose symptoms are inadequately controlled with ICS. Factors that can actually predict a good response from omalizumab or Zolaire are a high blood eosinophil count, 
high um, exhaled nitric oxide, if patients have a positive skin prick testing to arrow allergens, and if they have asthma that presents in childhood as opposed to an adult onset. Newer biologics include the anti-interleukin-5 drugs mepolizumab and reslizumab. Benralizumab binds to the interleukin-5 receptor, causing eosinophil apoptosis. By blocking the effects of interleukin-5, which is known to play a central role in promoting eosinophilic inflammation, these drugs cause a reduction in circulating eosinophils. Factors that can predict a good response to anti-interleukin-5 therapy include a high baseline blood eosinophil count, patients that have frequent exacerbations per year, if they have adult onset asthma, and if they're also positive for um, concomitant nasal polyps. The newest of the biologi biologic agents targets interleukin-4. This drug has been shown to be most effective if patients have frequent exacerbations, a high blood eosinophil count, or if they're on chronic oral steroids. This slide summarizes characteristics of the available biologics. Note, again, omalizumab is FDA approved for treating patients as young as six, and reslizumab is approved only in patients greater than or equal to 18. Note that they're all given by sub-Q injection, except reslizumab. That's an IV infusion, and it's actually given in the provider's office over 20 to 50 minutes. The dosing frequency is also similar. However, benralizumab is pushed to every eight weeks, so once every two months, after three doses of uh, every four week apart, um, doses times three. The other thing that I really want to point out here is that mepolizumab and dupilumab are approved for self-administration. And the injection site suggestions are similar to insulin, so they include the belly or the thigh. This slide briefly summarizes the evidence with biologics, including their FDA approvals, approved dosing strategies, and clinical effects. I want to highlight that these drugs are really effective. They reduce exacerbations and improve lung function. Benralizumab, for example, reduces exacerbation rates by 28 to 51 percent, omalizumab by 40 percent, and even more if the patient has a high eosinophil count at baseline. Mepolizumab reduces exacerbations by 47 to 53 percent, and also higher if eosinophils are more than 500 at baseline. Similarly, reslizumab and dupilumab also reduce exacerbations by more than half, and spirometry and oral steroid dosing has actually been reduced with dupilumab. Next, let's talk about some factors we want to be aware of and monitor for. Anaphylaxis is rare, but possible. Anaphylaxis has happened as soon as the first dose and even after a year of dosing. Patients should be educated on the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and have access to injectable epinephrine, like an EpiPen or an AubiQ device. Published literature using animal models suggests that interleukin-5 and eosinophils are part of an early inflammatory reaction at the site of tumor initiation and can actually promote tumor rejection. However, other reports indicate that eosinophilic infiltration into tumors can promote tumor growth. True malignancy risk from these biologics is probably unknown. Eosinophils may be involved in the immune system's response to parasitic or helminth infections. So patients with active helminth infections should be treated prior to starting a biologic agent. So here's how I look at biologics for severe asthma. A patient is on step four or five therapy, but still symptomatic. We want to again ensure good adherence, good device technique, and no other concomitant disease states are interfering with control. Then we want to investigate the patient's asthma phenotype. So we send them for skin prick testing, IgE level, FENO, or the fraction of uh, ex exhaled nitric oxide, or blood eosinophil count. Pick a biologic based on the outcome desired. So you want to potentially decrease exacerbation frequency, improve their pulmonary function, or reduce chronic oral steroid dosing. And then you monitor your therapy. So are the emergency department visits and hospitalization numbers coming down? Are people missing less work and school days? Is their quality of life improved? Are their symptom scores better? If so, you would continue therapy. There is not a lot of data to guide decision-making regarding the duration of use of these agents. If patients are responding and they're not experiencing adverse effects, it's reasonable to continue their use. 
As we discussed, step five therapy should be reserved for patients that are still symptomatic and having frequent exacerbations, despite good device technique and good adherence. Biologic agents show clinically meaningful responses in clinical trials, but they are expensive. Monitoring for possible injection site reactions, anaphylaxis, and helminth infections is important. Monitoring for improvement in asthma exacerbation rates, pulmonary function, quality of life, and symptom scores is also vital. So we're back to our initial question. So let's just take a second. Which of the following patients is the best candidate for an as-needed ICS LABA therapy? A patient with A, infrequent asthma symptoms, B, asthma symptoms more than twice a week, C, troublesome asthma symptoms on most days, or D, initially presents with an acute exacerbation. Hopefully everyone is comfortable stating A is the correct of these four answers. Patients with intermittent or mild persistent asthma would be candidates for PRN Symbacort per GINA 2019. And our last question, which of the following may be uh, self-administered? As I stated earlier, mepolizumab and dupilumab are FDA approved for self-administration, making the correct answer D. And with that, I will take any questions that anyone has. Hearing none, I'm going to sign off for the afternoon. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.